Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. The trouble with a long weekend in Wales is that a long weekend is too short. There just isn't enough weekend for what Wales has to offer. Take the Welsh coastline. Whatever way you like your sand, you'll find it in Wales. For the active, there are surfing beaches all round the coast at Marlow Sands, at Aberdaran, and particularly at Rossilli Beach on the Gower Peninsula, which offers some of the best surf in Europe. Sailing, too, is widely available, with yachting centres such as Tenby in the south, Aberdovi in mid-Wales, and Abersoch on the Len Peninsula in the north. There are big open beaches and there are small secluded bays and coves. The six miles of Pending Sands, for instance, in Carmarthen Bay, are so long and wide that they are frequently used for different kinds of racing events. While Landwind Bay, on a southern corner of Anglesey, offers four miles of sand and dune and countless vantages for the spectacular view across the bay to, to Snowdonia. Barrafangal Bay in the Pembrokeshire National Park is as secluded as they come, and like Munt, a golden sandy beach trapped in a tiny sheltered cove at the southern end of Cardigan Bay, basks in tranquility. And of course, there are many old fishing villages, Langranog and Barmouth among them. And of course, there are many old fishing villages, Langranog and Barmouth among them, whose charm has increased as the fleets of ships have declined. These days, you see, the fishing in Wales is much more for pleasure than profit. For sea fishermen, rivers like the Dee and the Usk provide some of the most available salmon fishing in the UK. Is it any wonder that Wales lures fishermen in droves? And is it any wonder that there are hundreds of cosy lake and riverside inns to accommodate them? Wales is teeming with interesting places to stay and interesting things to do. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Good morning. Welcome to the Science Museum. There's so much to do here. You could spend all day going from one exhibition to another. But if your time is limited, I'd suggest choosing maybe just one main exhibition. At the moment, I suggest that you don't miss our new exhibition of everyday inventions, 
It's amazing to see how objects we use in our daily lives, like paper clips, tea bags, and light bulbs, were invented in the first place, and how they've developed over the years into such an essential part of our lives that we hardly ever notice them. You shouldn't miss it. The other thing I'd suggest, if you don't have much time, is a guided tour of the free exhibitions. These tours usually start on the hour, at one o'clock, two o'clock, and so on. They're quite short, only half an hour, so you could do a couple of tours in an afternoon if you wanted to. If you'd like to go on a tour, you should go to the entrance of the exhibition on the ground floor and wait for the guide there. Just to give you an idea of the range of exhibitions we have here at the museum, I'm going to tell you about the exhibitions and activities we have for visitors of different ages. First of all, for the little ones. We have a fascinating area called shapes and patterns, where they can play with objects and images and see how they form different patterns. It's really colourful and exciting. Kids love it. Then, at the other end of the scale, we have more complex exhibitions that appeal more to our older visitors. There's one about the history of aviation, how planes developed over the years. Older visitors may even be able to remember some of the earlier planes on display. Another exhibition that adults might particularly enjoy is the energy exhibition. It shows the historical development of different forms of energy in Britain and how it has powered industry over the centuries. And of course, we mustn't forget the teenagers. There are lots of exhibitions to interest them, but my favourite one is the one where visitors can find out more about how physics works. It's a fun exhibition with plenty of hands-on activities that explore how light and heat and chemicals work. I still go there myself now and then. It's brilliant. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Most of our exhibitions are free, but you will need a ticket for some of the special ones, like the three D film shows. So let me explain how you get a ticket online. Of course, you can do this directly at the ticket office, but if there's a long queue, you can book online on your mobile. So go to our home page and choose the events button. Then click on the film title. That'll take you to the next window. In the right-hand corner, you'll see a little calendar. Choose the date on the calendar and then go to the next window. There's a drop-down box there for you to choose the time and another one for the number of tickets. Careful on that page. There are different prices for adults and children. When you've done that, go to the final page and choose your payment method. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three students discussing a program of activities for new students at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully 
and answer questions 21 to 26. So you were both on last year's orientation course then. How did it go? I loved it. The activities were well organised and I met people from all over the world. Yes, it was useful. And you think I should sign up for this year's course? Yes, definitely. Apart from being fun, it really does prepare you for all the things you have to do in your first couple of weeks. In fact, one of the most useful things was chatting to people who'd already been there for a year, so-called senior students. They'd been on the orientation course the year before last and recommended it to us. Oh, and there was a great atmosphere at the formal dinner too. It was so colourful with people in their traditional dress from Asia, Africa, South America. It was one of the high points of the whole week. <laughs> that was right at the end, of course. The first thing they did on the Monday was take us on a guided tour of the Students' Union. And after that, they took us round the city centre, showing us things like the bus station, the main shops... And the best pubs. <laughs> right, so it was very worthwhile. Yes, though maybe they could have taken us to a better nightclub. The music at the place we went to was lousy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a matter of taste, surely. Well, anyway, the next day they showed us round everything on the campus. And believe me, it was everything. We must have walked miles. I could have done with less information on every building in sight, given that I'll probably never need to go into half of them, and a bit more on places everyone's likely to use at some time or other, like the sports block, the health centre, the bicycle and car parks. Which reminds me, there was an afternoon session on how to drive in this country, which seemed to me a bit weird, you know, for a university course. I suppose it's because there have been accidents involving students who aren't used to people driving on the left. I was there, actually. How was it? Well, I must say I was a bit disappointed. There were some useful driving tips, but it might have been more helpful if it had included stuff for pedestrians. How to avoid getting run over, for example. You didn't go to the session on safety, then? No. Well, apparently that dealt with road safety for pedestrians, along with lots of other aspects, of course. I wasn't there myself, but that might be something worth going to, Julia. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I like the sound of the whole thing. Tell me, what's the accommodation like? Do you have a room to yourself or do you have to share? What do you have to take with you? For the orientation course, you'll have an individual room in one of the halls of residence. That'll be a different hall from the one you're booked into for the year, but they're both on the campus so you won't have far to go. And you won't have to take much with you. The room will have chairs, table, wardrobe, bed, mattress, blankets, sheets and so on. Take a warm coat or jacket, though. It may well rain and it's unlikely to reach even 20 degrees in late September. But it shouldn't drop below about 10, at least during the day, which is something, I suppose. <laughs> right. Now, I know they can't do much about the weather, but did you have the feeling that they were looking after you on the course? Yes, we did. There were some little touches that showed they'd thought about what it was like to be starting a course of study abroad. Such as? Well, it's just a small example, but they gave us free email access to contact people at home. 30 minutes, if I remember correctly. Actually, I think it was 20. Mm, yes, you're right. I was on for over half an hour and paid for an extra 10 or 15 minutes. Not that it was much. <laughs> Emails don't take long to write anyway. No, they don't. So, just one more thing. The timetable. When does the course actually start and finish? Well, a lot of people get there on the Sunday, though you'd have to find a room for an extra night, as the course accommodation is only booked from the Monday when things get going. Mm -hmm. Then they'll keep you busy all week until the dinner on the Friday. And that's it, is it? Yes. There's nothing after that. 
though most people stay over till Saturday, partly to recover from the party, <laughs> but also because they can then move straight into their permanent rooms. <laughs> I think I'll do that. Well, thanks a lot for all your advice. I'm sure I'll enjoy the course. I wish I could go on this year's too. <laughs> That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear three students discussing exam techniques with their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Morning, everyone. I thought we'd get together today and just talk about exam techniques. I'm sure everyone has different ideas about them. So, shall we find out what you do first when you get into an exam? Check that you have the right exam paper. <laughs> It sounds funny, but students do actually answer the wrong exam paper sometimes. So check that it's your exam first. Then what? Write your examination number on the answer sheet. Well, it might sound obvious, but writing your examination number at the beginning of the exam can be a good idea. Apart from making sure the examiner knows who wrote the exam, can anyone say why? It can help you relax? Yes, that's right. Doing something easy like that gives you a chance to calm down. Right, so what do you do next? Read the questions carefully. Well, before you read the questions, what should you do? Read the instructions. Yes, you should read the instructions next. You need to know how many questions you have to answer and whether you have to answer all the questions or only some what other important information do you need to check before you start how much time you have yes jerry's right you need to make sure that you know how long the exam is so you can manage your time properly okay what do you do next read the questions yes it's very important to read the questions not just once but several times I usually make a few notes when I'm looking at the questions. Sometimes a question looks easy, and then when you start writing, you realize that it's actually more difficult than you thought. Yeah, but you don't want to spend too much time writing notes. No, but it's a good idea to jot down a few ideas to see if you can remember the arguments for the topics you studied most. Once we've decided, is it better just to start at the beginning and answer the questions as they appear on the exam, or should we start with the easy questions? Mm, well, I start with the questions that I know better and leave the ones I'm not sure of for the end. That's what I do, but I still keep an eye on the clock, especially when the questions are all worth the same number of marks. Max, right. If you write one very good answer, but it's only worth 30% of the marks, you still lose the other 70% on that exam. So, it's better to write our main ideas for a question, even if we don't have time to answer it properly? Yes, absolutely. We can't give you marks for writing nothing. But if you give us your main ideas, we can give you some marks. Oh, really? I wish I'd known that in my last exam. I spent all my time writing a long answer to one of the questions and didn't get round to the other two. I didn't understand why I got such a low mark. Yeah, 
That's what happened to me. Luckily, my tutor explained it afterwards, so I never did that again. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.